Hello YouTube. Today we're going to continue uh, looking at some of the objections that have been raised to the appeal to intuitions in philosophy. Uh, so uh, a third objection uh, is uh, that a great deal of work in the field known as experimental philosophy has shown that people often have conflicting intuitions. Uh, there is substantial variation in intuitive judgments. Uh, experimental philosophy is uh, a very recent movement in philosophy uh, that uh, says that basically philosophers need to get off the armchair. They need to start um, adopting more of the methods of empirical science uh, to answer philosophical questions. Uh, one important method in experimental philosophy involves going out into the world and uh, presenting people with thought experiments and then getting their intuitions about those thought experiments. So you do a study where you get 500 participants, say, and then you present Gettier cases to them and you ask them whether the people in the Gettier cases have knowledge. Uh, so in many ways this is m maybe more like sociology or psychology than traditional philosophy. Uh, the motivation for this is that in the standard method of philosophy, where philosophers just sit on armchairs and think about things, we're only getting intuitions from a very specific group of people. Uh, they're generally uh, white, male, highly educated academics working in one specific field. Uh, if we're going to say that intuitions can be evidence for or against our philosophical theories, well, we better check that people actually share these intuitions. Um, I mean, the, the worry is that philosophers aren't a representative sample of people. So, you know, how, how can we know that, that philos philosophers' intuitions are representative? Uh, so some recent uh, results in experimental philosophy <coughs> have cast doubt on uh, the appeal to intuition. There's a famous paper by uh, Weinberg, Nichols and Stitch called Normativity and Epistemic Intuitions. They gave Gettier cases to various groups of undergraduate students and they found that while Westerners tended to agree that people in Gettier situations don't have knowledge, people with East Asian and South Asian backgrounds tended to think they do have knowledge. It was 74% uh, of Westerners thought that uh, Gettier cases did, did not have knowledge compared with just 43 and 39% of the East and South Asians. Um, actually, I, I find it pretty pretty striking that it was just seventy four percent of uh, of Westerners. You know, so there's not only is there um, significant cross cultural variation here, but you know, even within even within Westerners, uh, a quarter of people uh, judge that um, people in Gettier cases actually do have knowledge, which is you know maybe a bit surprising given how philosophers just take it as obvious that that Gettier cases are not cases of knowledge. <clears throat> Similarly, we find that intuitions vary with personality. Uh, experimental studies on people's views of free will, for example, have found that uh, compatibilist intuitions are more common in extroverts. Uh, so compatibilism is, is the view that free will is compatible with determinism. Uh, if you look up experimental philosophy, you can find studies on uh, all sorts of things, and they have this the conclusion that Intuitive judgments vary based on ethnic background, based on personality, uh, education, gender, and so on. If we're going to use intuitions as evidence, the question is whose intuitions are right? H how do we decide who's right when intuitions conflict? Um, you know, Galileo famously turned his telescope to Jupiter, and he saw that Jupiter had four moons. And this challenged some of the uh, assumptions of the Aristotelian worldview that helped support, and it helped support the Copernican revolution. Now imagine if it were consistently the case that when astronomers uh, looked at Jupiter through a telescope, some of them just didn't see any moons. So two groups of astronomers could, could look at Jupiter at the same time through equally good telescopes. One group would say they see four moons, the other group only sees the planet. And you know, there's no a priori reason to think that either group is crazy or anything like that. Well, I mean, I think that, that would have seriously undermined Galileo's evidence. Uh, if we don't have consensus on what the, the basic data is, then we can't use that data to support our theories. I mean, maybe a, a more general way to put this point is that if two groups have conflicting intuitions, then 
well, it would seem that one group must be wrong. Um, I mean, maybe you can explain this away sometimes, but if these kinds of conflicts happen frequently between groups of people who are uh, equally intelligent and well-informed, well, that would seem to suggest that intuition is just unreliable. So what might we say in, in response to this? Well, one important point is that there's still a lot of controversy about these experimental results. Um, you may have heard of the uh, replication crisis in science. There's been a growing worry in the last decade or so uh, about the high number of published scientific results that fail to be replicated in subsequent studies. Uh, experimental philosophy suffers from this uh, just as much. Uh, later studies using Gettier cases failed to find any significant differences between ethnic groups. Um, so, you know, it's still early days in some ways. You know, it might turn out that variability in intuition has been overstated. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, you know, experimental philosophers have by now built up a pretty enormous literature. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of studies showing variation in intuitions. Some of these studies might fail to be replicated, but it, I mean, it's looking pretty likely at this point, I think, that, that some of these results are going to be robust. And there does seem to be more, intuit more um, variation in, in, in intuitions than we might initially have expected. Uh, so uh, another response is to question the way that these experiments are conducted. Uh, these studies uh, focus on lay people, people outside of philosophy, and they often involve uh, presenting the thought experiments and then asking the participants what they think. But maybe the participants just don't understand the context properly. Maybe they don't really know how to evaluate what they're being asked. Uh, I've certainly noticed that when I talk to my girlfriend or my family members about philosophy, which, I mean, I should say that's usually because they ask me. Uh, I don't subject people to philosophy unless I'm asked. Um, but sometimes they'll ask me about it. And there's often a, a really just uh, kind of deep um, disconnection. It, it can be very difficult to explain the relevance of certain arguments. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's one thing if you've been sitting in a series of lectures and then you're presented with certain arguments. But when, when you try to explain some philosophical problems to lay people, uh, I find that they, they just don't really seem to understand kind of where you're coming from or what the relevance of certain points are, because it, it requires a kind of philosophy background to understand that relevance. You know, I mean, it's just like any technical subject. I'm sure that physicists have difficulty explaining, um, you know, results in physics to, to lay people and so on. So m many of these philosophical cases, like Gettier cases, they're really quite bizarre taken in themselves, and they don't make much sense without uh, a bit of philosophical background. Um, so maybe this gives us good reason to discount the intuitions of lay people, or, or we might say that when when lay people are asked these situations, they don't understand the context, so they're not really expressing their genuine intuitions. Uh, maybe a similar response to this is um, the expertise defence. And th the thought here is that academic subjects produce expertise. It's reasonable to assume that people who have been trained in a subject for decades will have a special competence in that subject. Try uh, looking at a cell through a microscope without any training. Um, what you'll probably get is a sort of confused mass of colours and shapes. It takes time before you can say, oh, you know, that's a mitochondrion. Right? It, it requires training before you can uh, sort of use the microscope properly and know how to observe with it. Uh, philosophy, we should expect, also produces expertise, and philosophers are trained specifically in using thought experiments and appealing to intuitions. So people who are trained in philosophy are expert intuitors. Experimental philosophers have tried to challenge the appeal to intuition by showing that when you go out and ask lay people for their intuitions, we find substantial variability. But if we think that philosophers are expert intuitors, whereas the intuitions of lay people are unreliable, well, that's entirely to be expected. Now, uh, this uh, is a quite a popular response, but it faces a number of problems. So one first worry is, remember that the whole point of intuitions is that they're supposed to be uh, pre-reflective, pre-theoretical judgments. And that's what allows them to serve as evidence that can help decide between competing theories. 
So it immediately strikes us that people in Gettier cases don't have knowledge. And this is supposed to be independent of any sophisticated theory of knowledge. And this means that our intuitions about Gettier cases are a kind of neutral base of data. I mean, that's the idea. But philosophers, of course, spend all their time developing theories of things. And so the worry is that immersion in a particular philosophical tradition will bias your intuitions. The theories you accept are going to alter what you're inclined to believe. Um, the theories will, will alter your intuitions, in which case intuitions would no longer be a, a neutral judge of theories. So from this point of view, far from being expert intuitors, the intuitions of a philosopher uh, are, will, if anything, we should expect them to be skewed based on the tradition uh, or the theories that the philosophers accept. Uh, a second concern with this expertise defense is that it's just a bit, it's just too vague, basically. Uh, it's fairly trivial to say that training in philosophy will increase your expertise in some respect, right? I mean, nobody doubts that. Philosophers are better than average at you know, technical writing. Uh, they have greater knowledge of the history of philosophy. Uh, they're uh, better at constructing arguments and seeing the logical connections between ideas and and so on. I mean, none of that is really in question. We surely get expertise in that sense. But in order for the expertise defence to work in this context, we would need to show that philosophical training removes whatever sources of unreliability affect folk intuitions. So we need to identify exactly what it is that makes folk intuitions unreliable, and then we need to show how training in philosophy removes this. Uh, you know, and it, I mean, if we can't do that, well, maybe we shouldn't be comparing philosophy to biologists using microscopes, say, but rather to some sort of pseudoscience. People who practice pseudoscience will develop various skills, um, but the problem is, is that none of those skills are sort of geared towards the truth, at least in, in the relevant respect. Um, so that's a, a bit of one concern with this expertise defense. Now, I mean, there is, of course, a kind of feedback element going on with respect to philosophical intuitions. If you're in the epistemology classroom and you're presented with Gettier cases, well suppose you have the intuition that actually people in Gettier cases do have knowledge. Well in that case you'd be pretty quickly corrected by the teacher. The teacher will point out, um, no this is generally seen as failing to be knowledge. Um, and so you know, any kind of training involves the student making mistakes and the teacher correcting them. And we might think that that's what goes on with intuitions. When students make mistakes in their intuitive judgments, the teacher corrects them. And so philosophy does produce uh, expertise in intuition. But of course, the problem here is that there are two ways of interpreting what's going on in the philosophy classroom. We might say on the one hand that the teacher is a more reliable intuitor and by correcting the student, this improves the student's ability to generate reliable intuitions. On the other hand, we might think that standard philosophical intuitions are mere conventions. Uh, correcting the student's intuitions is more analogous to correcting their table manners. I mean, the, the mere fact that somebody in authority corrects your intuitions doesn't show that you will develop more reliable intuitions, because we still haven't explained why is it that the intuitions of laypersons go wrong and how is it that philosoph philosophical training removes that problem? Um, a, fi a final problem with the uh, expertise defense is that it has been challenged by uh, experimental work on philosophers themselves. If we're saying that the intuitions of philosophers are more reliable than the intuitions of lay people, we would expect philosophical intuitions to be free from the kind of variation that afflicts lay persons' intuitions. Um, so I, I mentioned that when we ask lay people for their judgments about free will, we find that extroverts tend to have uh, more compatibilist intuitions. Uh, Edward Schulz and colleagues uh, in the article Persistent Bias in Expert Judgments about Free Will and Moral Responsibility, uh, they found that this effect holds for philosophers of, as, as well. Extroverted philosophers tend to have more compatibilist intuitions than introverted philosophers. Uh, Edward Mackery in the article Expertise and Intuitions About Reference, uh, he compared the uh, intuitions of 
uh, different groups of experts who work on language. So he analysed uh, linguists and philosophers of language. Uh, he asked them for their intuitions on cases bearing on the nature of reference in language. Uh, and he found that different areas of specialisation had different intuitions. Um, so you know, the area of specialisation you work in has a substantial effect on your intuitions. Um, all these people were experts in the study of language, but with different training, they had different intuitions um, about cases relating to the nature of language. So the variation in intuition persists even among experts, which would seemingly undermine this expertise defence. OK, so that's uh, experimental philosophy. Uh, a lot of uh, interesting arguments there. Um, so you know, it's worth, worth looking that up and reading a bit more about it. Uh, a fourth sceptical worry about intuition is that intuitions don't have the appropriate causal connection to the world. If we consider other sources of knowledge like perception and memory, uh, well, you know, yes, we know that they're not perfect and it may be difficult to come up with a justification for them, but still we can see a plausible causal pathway between perception and memory and the objects that they seemingly give us knowledge of. So take perception. In the case of perception, you have an object. Light bounces off the object and enters your eyes. Your eyes then transmit this information to your brain, and this results in a visual perception of the object. This is a straightforward causal pathway from the object to your perception. Now, of course, this isn't an argument that perception is accurate, but what it does do is it shows us that we're, we're at least in a position where perception could be accurate. Right? I mean, we, at least with perception, there's a plausible story about how it could deliver reliable information. And these days, of course, uh, the sciences of optics and neurophysiology have given us a very detailed account of how this process works. But even before the development of modern science, you didn't need a sophisticated theory to understand in at least a basic outline how perception could connect you up to the world. And a similar story can be told for memory. In the case of memory, um, that there's some sort of event, maybe some perception or whatever, or emotional experience or something like that and this induces a change in your brain and then that change is retained over time so again there's there's a causal pathway now with intuition on the other hand it's not at all clear that there's any uh, I mean we don't seem to have any set idea of what the causal connection between the world and the intuition would be so consider moral intuitions if you're a moral realist, then you think that there are moral facts, uh, and the method of using cases to generate moral intuitions can guide us towards these facts. But the question is, how do the moral facts connect with the moral intuitions? Just like vision, uh, you know, we, we, we have a fact, let's say the wrongness of convicting an innocent man, and then we have a mental event, the intuition that it's wrong to convict an innocent man. So in that respect, vision and intuition are, are similar. But the problem with intuition is, well, how does, how does the, the, the wrongness, how does the fact, the wrongness of convicting an innocent man connect up to the intuition that it's wrong to convict an innocent man? I mean, I'm not asking for a well-developed scientific theory or anything like that. I mean, I, I'm just asking in very general terms, right? Can, can you give some basic general story about what that connection might be? Um, I mean, the trouble is it doesn't seem like anybody has the slightest idea. Uh, so uh, one response to this uh, uh, view is that, well, it doesn't apply to all intuitions. Uh, recall that uh, Goldman uh, distinguishes a special class of what he calls application intuitions. These are intuitions about how certain cases are to be classified. We use these intuitions when we engage in conceptual analysis. Uh, you know, we, we want to understand the concept of knowledge or the concept of justice or whatever. Now, it's perfectly clear how there could be an appropriate connection between the concept and uh, an intuition generated by that concept. Say, you know, so between the concept of knowledge and then intuitions about whether or not certain cases fall under that concept. Uh, Goldman suggests it's just in the nature of possessing a concept that it gives rise to intuitions about when that concept does or doesn't apply. To possess a concept just is uh, to have you know, a, a pro-intuition towards correct application 
and an anti-intuition towards incorrect application. If somebody didn't have that, if somebody didn't know when a particular concept applies, well, I mean, surely we'd just say they, did, they don't understand the concept. Uh, so as long as we're just engaging in conceptual analysis, uh, the objection from, from causal connection would seem to fail. But still, I mean, this would, you know, I mean, if we take this seriously, it, it would seem to require uh, some reform in, in how philosophy works, because philosophers will appeal to sort of intuitions in general, not just application intuitions. Okay, a final intuition to, a uh, final objection to intuition uh, is that reliance on intuition is unacceptably conservative. I mean, so to say that something is intuitive is often almost synonymous with saying that it's commonsensical, right? Uh, it just sort of strikes us as being, as being true. It seems true. Now, for many people, the appeal of philosophy is precisely that philosophy challenges uh, intuition and common sense, or at least philosophy should be, should be about that. And philosophy, more than any other uh, academic field, is a place where you should be able to explore genuinely radical ideas. From this point of view, you might say, well, who cares about intuition? Who cares whether or not something is intuitive? If anything, philosophers should be trying to violate intuitions. Historically, uh, progress has often involved doing violence to accepted concepts. If you were to go back 500 years and ask astronomers for their intuitions about the concept of stars, they'd probably uh, have told you that stars are objects that orbit the Earth, that stars are fixed to the outer celestial sphere, that stars are relatively close to the Earth, and so on. The modern concept of stars is radically different. And you know, it's pretty clear that if we, if we did go back and, and ask these and, and do a kind of um, conceptual analysis of the concept of star 500 years ago, I mean, it doesn't seem like that would really have told us anything interesting. It wouldn't have told us anything interesting about the world or about even about our concepts. Um, and maybe a similar fate awaits the concepts that are currently dealt with by philosophers. Consider uh, knowledge. Uh, maybe the way that we think about knowledge is radically defective. We've seen that uh, traditional epistemologists uh, treated knowledge as justified true belief, and then uh, the Gettier cases from uh, the 60s and, 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 and afterwards have led epistemologists to, to ask what else needs to be added, right? I mean, it's justified true belief plus something else. Uh, or maybe we can remove uh, the justification criterion and, and, and use something else other than justification. But, uh, you know, basically we're, we're, we're taking this idea of justified true belief and then thinking about how to modify it in a relatively minor way in the face of Gettier problems. But maybe this starting point of justified true belief is just completely misguided. So uh, eliminative materialists like uh, Paul and Pat Churchland appeal to developments in modern neuroscience to deny that beliefs exist. They would say that there just is no such mental state as a belief. Nobody has any beliefs. I have a couple of videos on eliminative materialism if you want to learn uh, more about it. it. It's a theory that can sound uh, very bizarre, but then I mean, many theories that seem very bizarre turned out to be right. Uh, but so, so if the eliminativists are correct, then we're faced with two options, right? We either have to say that knowledge doesn't even involve belief, right? In, in which case we're looking for a fundamentally different analysis of knowledge. The, 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 this whole project of, that sort of began with justified true belief, that's totally misguided. We're looking for an analysis of knowledge which is radically different. Uh, or the other option um, is just to eliminate knowledge as well, to say that nobody has any knowledge. Uh, and I mean, presumably it would be, something else would be the, the epistemic state that we aim for. Um, but if we eliminate knowledge, then it seems that there's not really much to be gained from analysing the concept of knowledge. I mean, in the same way, philosophers don't need to analyse the concept of which because there just are no witches. So by using intuitions as evidence for or against philosophical theories, we end up preserving our current conceptual framework when philosophers really should be challenging it. Uh, maybe like the Churchlands, we should take science as our starting point and then 
work out what the best scientific theories imply about philosophical questions, and it just doesn't matter if it's counterintuitive. So uh, those are some objections to the appeal to intuition in philosophy. I think one question that's worth ending on is, uh, you know, we've, we've seen that, that intuitions are a central part of the contemporary philosophical method. So if we follow the sceptics and abandon intuition, what's left? I mean, can we do philosophy without appealing to intuitions? If you pick up almost any philosophical article, they may not, uh, they may not use the word intuition or any of its derivatives, but if you analyse the argument, there will probably be appeals to intuition in there somewhere. Uh, for that matter, if we abandon intuition, can we even do science? I mean, prima facie, scientists appeal to uh, observation to decide between theories. They use you know, perceptual information and scientific instruments to, to generate observations. But then there are questions about how, uh, how do observations connect to theories? I mean, how do observations support theories? How do we decide how much weight to place on particular observations? Um, how do we decide when certain instrumental results are to be discounted? Uh, I mean, which is very common in science. Um, so uh, a famous example is Eddington's uh, eclipse, the, the eclipse photographs that were taken to establish uh, relativity theory against Newtonian mechanics. Uh, it turns out that actually some of the photographs would have been, would have sort of been more in line with the Newtonian predictions than with uh, the predictions of relativity theory. Uh, though the photographs had supported relativity theory because there, there were certain uh, methods that were used to discount some of them. Uh, and that, you know, that's very common in, in science. You, you don't just take all of the raw data at once. We have to apply methods to decide which data is reliable. Uh, now, arguably, in coming to conclusions like this, we're going to be appealing to intuitions at some point in the arguments. Um, I mean, if you, if you uh, watch my Philosophy of Science series, you'll see that scientific reasoning is often quite complex and it you know, often comes with certain uh, assumptions. It's worth considering how intuitions might fit into this. So, uh, you know, that's one, one challenge, right? What, what do we have left if intuitions are, are out? Um, Okay, that's all. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.